Hello, everybody, and welcome to Adler Astronomy Live. My name is Meredith. I'm going to be your host. And today we're going to talk about mapping a billion stars. What does that mean? How does that even work? We're going to find out today. Um, as you all may know, the Adler Planetarium is closed to the public. So because of that, we're trying to find fun ways to bring some of our awesome programming online to you. If any of you have actually been in our building, you might remember one of our spaces called the Space Visualization Lab. This is an area of the museum where guests could walk in and actually interact with and talk to a real astronomer or real expert about their field of science and see some really cool space visualizations to help back up what you're learning. So it's just a space where you can walk in, talk to somebody and actually see what you're hearing about. It's, it's one of my favorite spaces. I miss it. As you all can see, we are just currently in our own homes. I'm actually hailing to you from my parents' house in Pure, Michigan. Um, because of that, you might get some fun bonus content, such as somebody's cat or a child jumping on screen, or maybe a technical difficulty, or maybe one of my parents' landlines ringing. Uh, remember landlines? They have several of them throughout the house, and they ring all the time. So because of that, we just ask for your patience and understanding, and we hope that you are ready to have some fun. Okay, we have two experts with us today. We have Aaron Geller and Jackie Faraday. Aaron is an astronomer at the Adler Planetarium and at Northwestern, and he studies how stars and planets are born and how they change over time. Hi, Aaron. Hi, everybody. Glad to be here again. How is it in Chicago? I haven't, I, I miss it. Is it hot? It, you know, it's, it's nice. Nice. Love it. Um, Jackie is a senior scientist and a senior education manager at the American Museum of Natural History, uh, who studies brown dwarfs and low mass stars. Hi, Jackie, where are you joining us from? Hi, Meredith. I am actually in New Jersey, where I have unexpectedly been since quarantine started. And so you might see some small children run in here as my nieces and nephews are with me. Amazing. I hope that we get a little a little uh, hello from a niece or nephew. I don't think you do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll see. Um, let's all hope for something. Um, okay, also, today's program is meant to be totally interactive, which means we really want to hear from you. Please ask us questions, ask questions to our experts. Um, Aaron with an E is going to be joining you in the YouTube chats. So everybody wave and say hi to Aaron on YouTube. Please utilize your chat function. Send Aaron your questions. Aaron's going to get them over to us. Um, and also, Aaron will be sharing some different links with you all throughout today's program. Please click on them and check them out. Okay, I think we are ready to start. Um, so as we were putting this program together, we realized that a lot of today's program kind of talks about the fusion of art and science. So why don't we start with some art that uh, was influenced by science? Aaron, you have something to show us. Aaron with an A. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I have a really great painting to share. Cool. And but before I do that, let me introduce the person who you're not seeing, Mark Subarau our director of the Space Visualization Group at the Adler is here with us kind of behind the curtain controlling all the visuals that you see. And I think he's gonna pull up this beautiful painting that I was just referring to from Frederick J. Brown, the artist, who, which we have on display in the Adler, thanks to the Frederick J. Brown Trust. And this is a painting uh, titled The Milky Way. So it's an envision and artistic interpretation of what the Milky Way looks like. This was made in 1977 in collaboration with the Adler Planetarium. And to give you a little background about the artist, Mr. Brown was born in Georgia and raised in the south side of Chicago and later moved to New York City and Arizona. So we have a bit of a connection here between Chicago and New York and all around the country. What you're looking at here is a really great study that he put together for this painting. So it's like the precursor to the painting. We also have that in our collection at the Adler. Brown's work was shaped by his African-American and Native American ancestry and his vast knowledge of art history. And here you can see a portrait and a picture of the artist himself. Uh, he was also very interested in astronomy and space, as you can see by that one painting that we just featured of the Milky Way. And he also has a few other space themed paintings as well. So check that out. And if you want to get more information, you can go to the Adler's Google uh, Arts and Culture page and Aaron is gonna share that, Aaron with an E, is gonna share that link in the chat. And just broadly speaking, this, this collaboration between Frederick J. Brown and the, and the Adler Planetarium to make this Milky Way painting, this is a great example of how art and science can come together to make something really beautiful. 
Yeah, and I just have to describe really quick. This painting is hanging in the Adler in an area where, you know, you're kind of just walking and you're like, oh, look at all these different things. And then all of a sudden there's this giant, beautiful painting on your left. And uh, I just see people get sucked into it. They'll just be walking and go, Whoa, and you could stare at it for so long. It's, it's one of my favorite things that we have at the Adler. Um, art, you know, who knew? Uh, Aaron, you're an artist, right? You have a background in art. Tell us I about do. it. Yeah, thanks for asking. I went into college, my undergrad, as a double major in physics and art. So like painting, drawing, sculpture. I you know, loved art all through growing up and didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do going into college. Through college, I kind of gravitated toward astronomy, and, uh, but I still kept art as a minor. And you know, fast forward to today, I still use art all the time in you know, so creating some of the visualizations that you'll see throughout the course of the, these shows that we have, Adler Astronomy Live, and for other purposes. Uh, I still do some of my own personal art, although probably the most that I do at home is little cute drawings of animals and mermaids and unicorns <laughs> for my kids. Do you have an example of a mermaid or a unicorn? <laughs> I wish I had one to share with you right now, but I, I don't. I'll keep that for, an, for another time. Okay, I'm going to spend the rest of the afternoon trying to convince Aaron to um, maybe post it on <laughs> the Adler's uh, Twitter or something. I don't know. We'll get it out there. Um, that's amazing, Erin. And at the Adler, we really appreciate art and the importance of using art to tell stories. I got hired at the Adler five years ago as an actor. I'm an actor and a comedian. Um, and I think that the Adler places an importance on making sure that uh, the folks who are presenting material to our guests are not just expertise in science, or experts in science, but they also have an expertise in presentation so that they know how to engage an audience and um, share stories through their art. So that's something that I've always appreciated and loved about the Adler and why pieces like uh, this one are, are just an incredible way to um, look at science, not through the standard scientific view. Um, also, Aaron, all of your visualiz visualizations are uh, beautiful works of art, in my opinion. So, um, Jackie, I feel like you use art as well in your field of science. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, you know, it, it, astronomy in general has a very rich history of artists and scientists coming together. If you go back to like the first maps of the sky, the astronomers were really not the ones to go to, to draw what people were seeing. Like constellations had gorgeous structure to them. You have Orion with this belt and he's off on a fight and there's dogs in the sky and there's a scorpion. So you would go to the artists to draw it and to represent the positions of the stars. So it's a rich history and, and a special transition to what we're gonna talk about today, is that um, it's a rich history between mappers, people that were mapping the stars and people that were showing that to everybody else. So um, I find that I, I'm not Aaron. I don't have a background in art because I was never good at it. I like photography because that didn't require me to draw anything because I do stick figures and that's it. But I do love, love how art brings an aspect of science out. And so to me, the visualization tools that we're about to jump right into here, Meredith, so we're going to do a little tour, yes. um, is an excellent visual representation, which I did work with artists on. We have artists at the Hayden Planetarium, where I work. Adler has Aaron and Mark, who's the Oz behind the curtain right now, that's about to show us some things. And um, in, in, in doing so, we can show you a scientifically realistic, but artistically beautiful take on the universe. So I think we can probably jump into it, right? Show us. This is going to blow y'all's mind. Sorry yeah. to hype it up right away, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what we'll do is we're going to switch into this software that's called Open Space. It's actually NASA funded, all open source. Anybody can download it. It's totally free. Uh, and where we've taken you is to a very special place in um, in the area around the sun and the earth, it's called a Lagrange point. And the Lagrange point is a point of stability in the earth, sun, moon system. It's about a million miles away. And that's where this, this little satellite here, this observatory called Gaia 
that the European Space Agency or ESA um, produced. And Mark has us kind of orbiting around. What you're seeing is the, um, from this perspective, the blue line that you're seeing is the orbit of the Earth around the sun. And those green lines are showing you Gaia going around and around and around the Earth uh, at this point about a million miles away. And what wow. Gaia does is as it scans the sky, it takes an image of the entire sky over and over and over and over again. And in so doing, it can compare where the stars are in each image and precisely tell you where they are and it does it on one side of the, uh, when we're on one side of the sun and the other, it's able to do this thing called parallax measurements. The exact same thing as like holding your thumb out in front of your face and blinking one eye and then blinking the other and seeing your thumb jump against a distant background. Mm. That's what this observatory in space a million miles away has been doing. Um, I think it's, I think, and this is my personal opinion, but I think it's very justified. I think it's the greatest mission we have ever launched into space. <gasps> yeah, yeah, I know that's bold, right? Like that's very bold, I realize. But it's I, so important. And I hope I convince you of this. I, I agree. I already agree. You've already convinced me. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't even showed you the data yet. <laughs> yes. So Mark's pulling us away now from, um, so we were in this viewpoint where you can see the solar system. So we're kind of leaving the solar system with each one of those colored lines there is the orbit of a planet in our solar system. And all the stars that you're seeing there, they're the bright stars in the sky. What Mark just turned on are the stars that Gaia has mapped. And Gaia didn't just take a picture of them. Gaia figured out how far away they are. And Mark just brightened them up. So now you should feel a bit intimidated by the vastness of stars in the sky, the overwhelming nature of the Milky Way, of the galaxy, of the stars in the galaxy. And all this, this is, this is an attempt to wow you. Um, we're at a distance of something like um, 2.9 light months away or so, Mark, right? I think that's about, that should be about where we're located and Mark's dimmed the stars back down. So the other thing that's super awesome is that not only do we know how, where these stars are, but we also know how they move. So Mark can now turn time on and so we can set time to instead go by at, you know, one every second, it's one second. It can be 50,000 years every second. Uh, and when we can set time forward and we can watch the time uh, the stars move, because here's the key, Meredith, um, the closest star to the sun is, okay, so the sun's the closest star to earth, but the closest sun to the star, um, star to the sun is called Proxima Centauri. Uh-huh. It is not always going to be the closest star, though. It is what? not always the closest star. Yes, this is what's crazy. Um, that it is, it is going to change. And the reason why we're out at this distance is because in a million years, at this distance away where you can see the glare of our sun there, uh -huh. another star called Gliese 710 is going to come right on by. So what does right on by mean? Like we can see it from here on Earth? Oh yeah, you can see it, you, you can see it now, but it's well, getting yeah. closer to us and we're getting closer to it. And so the best part is that we could, in theory, fly a mission out to the space where it's coming to and examine what's around it. So maybe it's got a solar system, right? It's in a million years though. A million years is a while from now. We could okay. fly a mission. Um, all right, I have a question for our YouTube audience. Do you think humans will be around in a million years to experience this and potentially send out a mission? Uh, let us know your thoughts, yes or no. Do you think that we will be around in a million years to experience this? Also, we do have a question. We have two questions, one from John Jay and one from Caitlin. Um, and they are wondering basically just about why it's called the Milky Way. And looking at this image, I think I have an idea as to why it's called the Milky Way, but maybe you can answer more thoroughly. Yeah, we get, the, uh, we get asked that a lot. I don't know the full history, but if you were to look up 
it looks like a stream of stars or a river of stars. And so the stars that are bright are, are um, they'll light up and give this cloudy hue to it. Um, that, and this is actually an encouraging uh, note that I would put out for anybody watching or listening to this, to go outside and look up. If you're in a dark sky, the Northern Hemisphere and in the Northern Hemisphere, Chicago, New York, New Jersey, you know, Northeast, Midwest, uh, Southwest, anywhere in the US, it, in a dark sky, you can see the Milky Way. In the summer, it stretches high above your sky. So this is an encourage, encouragement for people to go out and look at it. Yeah, you know, uh -huh. one of the things we always ask the people in the Adler when I'm there is we ask them, how many of you can actually step out in your backyards even and see the Milky Way? Because some people can, I, I can't. I live in kind of suburbs, there's a lot of light, but some people can. So if you're on YouTube, let us know, can you see the Milky Way from your backyard? Right now at my parents' house, you can see it if you let your eyes adjust and it's a perfectly clear night. No moon, no clouds. It's just barely there. But I've been to Flagstaff, Arizona where I was like, there it is, hi. <laughs> when you see it, it's great. I've actually observed in, um, used a telescope in Chile. Uh, and from there, I think it's, it's spectacular. It's the Southern sky. So it's slightly different and the Milky Way is a little bit brighter in the South because you get the center of the Milky Way that rises really high. And mm -hmm. you can actually uh, see shadows, shadows of yourself on a gorgeous clear night um, because of how bright the galaxy is. Oh my goodness. This That's is a bucket list thing for some people. You should go to a dark enough sky so that you can actually see your shadow. A I've never heard of that. From the, from the current data set. Um, amazing. Wait, I have a question for you, Jackie. Have you heard of the nemesis theory? And can you explain that to us? And also, is it real? Do you I, think? I have, and I would love to see if any of the YouTube watchers have heard about the nemesis theory or what they might actually think this is as I explain it. I'd love to hear wrong answers too as to what you think uh, the nemesis theory is. Um, but in astronomy, the nemesis theory is that our our sun has a nemesis or a partner, <laughs> something it was born with, um, another object that is moving through space and time with us that's very, very low mass. So you wouldn't be able to see it in your nighttime sky the way that we see. Like a low mass star is really, really dim. And if it's far enough away and can get hidden with a crowded area of stars. So people looked at the extinction periods on the planet in the 1980s and saw some cyclic nature to it as if we kind of always got hit with big asteroids like the one that that took out the dinosaurs mm -hmm. um every x number of years and they thought maybe that is the signature of a highly eccentric companion to the sun that comes in and knocks a bunch of material in towards the inner solar system but uh that has not come to light however the data set that mark has on now is um, a data set of uh, like 100,000 stars or so that are all co-moving with another star. So now we're orbiting out uh, at a further distance. Mark can tell me how far away we are. I'm not actually sure how far we've flown away, but he's turned time on, we're away from the sun. And now what you're seeing is not just the stars in the nighttime sky and not just the stars that Gaia did, but only the stars that have a companion, a friend, or perhaps from the perspective of a planet around one of those stars, a nemesis. That they, wow. Yeah. Nemesis. It, it looks like a couple's skating rink. Yeah, that's sweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, really quick, it looks like uh, we are very divided in our answer about whether or not we think that humans will be here in a million years. Looks like half say yes, half say no. One person says new set of humans. Who knows what that means? Uh, for some reason, the first thing that popped in my head is like, we are all uh, Edward Scissorhands and we have scissors for hands. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, but <laughs> anyway, I love this idea of new set of humans. Look at this amazing visual. Um, okay, so now YouTube answer for us. Do you think that do you think that the sun was born with another star? Do you think that we have 
a nemesis, a partner, a sibling? Uh, yes or no? Let us know your thoughts. I, I can say too that for food for thought, for those that are in here like, you guys are crazy. This seems like there's no way this could be. Astronomers are still looking for the companion. Um, and we'll get, actually, we're going to get to a little bit on that in the citizen science section of our, of our discussions here. Um, but interesting, stars are always born in families. Well, always. They're largely um, uh, made in families. And so the next data set we can show you is Mark can turn on instead this next data set, which for Meredith and Aaron, this is like basically fresh off the visualization press. Like we have not shown this many places before. It's going to show you when we look at the sky, all of the stars that we find, we can apply, we call friends of friends method. You look around and you say, hey, who are you moving with? Are you moving with somebody? And you find their friend. And then you say to that star, are you moving with somebody? And you find its, its star. And in doing so, you'll find all of these clumps, all of these large clumps out in space. Uh, it's how we have detected all of this new structure in the galaxy. Um, and the people that discovered it are two authors called Kunkel and Covey. And so the data set is called Kunkel in open space. So we can, and we can turn that on and brighten it. Um, we should also turn time back to now, because if we've gone too far, then all those stars are probably sent themselves off into no man's land. Um, but you know, Jackie, this, this idea of all the stars being born in families is, is so interesting to me. This is also what I study. As you know, I study stars that are born in clusters, which is what this visual that Jackie is describing will show if we can get it up there. And there it is. And so <gasps> I study this as well. And this is a fun and kind of overlap between what Jackie and I study. So yeah. Um, and I should say, Aaron has shown me some of the coolest visualizations of uh, clusters that formed and then eject things and devolve into something else. This right here, is a view from a couple thousand light years away from the sun of just this idea of friends of friends, like what stars are moving with who. And this, this is structure, Meredith. This is what your galaxy looks like. And now we'll move away. So it's that's so much science there, but wow. to wow you even more, we are really just scratching the surface. Oh my goodness, there's so much more to discover. Also, that looks like an iris of an eye. Does anybody else feel that? Some major Lord of the Rings vibes <laughs> of the eye. Um, beautiful. Wow. This should awe you. And these are, this is all the very, very recent discoveries. Um, much of this has only been known since 2018. And my guess is that everybody watching on YouTube here was born after 2018. We don't have any two-year-olds watching. So this is all discovered in your lifetime. Wow, this is incredible. And you said this is like very new, hot off the presses. So we are getting an exclusive look at the Lord of the Rings eye. <laughs> Brand new. Look at it sitting within our galaxy. Yeah, this is... Uh, you know, and there's more to discover, as you can see from this perspective, where Mark flies us outside of the galaxy, that we are, we're, we have so much to know and understand. And this is just one galaxy of billions and billions of galaxies. So our galaxy has billions of stars in it. We have been using that Gaia telescope to map, uh, to, to map out uh, 2 billion stars, which is a lot. But there are 100 to 200, maybe 300 billion stars in our own galaxy. So um, it's all about, you know, perspective. I think Guy is amazing and has done so much, but it's also scratching the surface. Incredible. And that's what inspires us to keep learning about space science because there's so much that we don't know yet. It's so exciting. Um, John Jay also wants everyone to know 
cool theory, really cool theory with the nemesis theory. And um, John Jay wants to learn more. Uh, really quick, it looks like everybody thinks that the son was born with a nemesis or a partner. Um, one person says, I like to think that the son has an evil twin. And then somebody else is getting a little excited thinking about alternate universe theories. I love that. Um, okay, so just in case, Anybody is just now joining us and missed the beginning. Um, this is Adler Astronomy Live. My name is Meredith. We're here with Jackie and Aaron. We're talking about what it means to map a billion stars. We just saw some brand new visuals. My mind is blown, my heart is racing. Uh, <laughs> if you are enjoying today's program, as I hope you are, we hope that you would consider uh, donating to the Adler's annual Celestial Ball fundraiser, which is coming up on September 12th. We hope that you'll join us. Um, this is the first year that the gala is gonna be totally digital. Uh, and every single donation helps us to bring these programs to you online. So we hope that you would consider any amount is welcome. Maybe you have $1.7 billion lying around uh, to match the number of stars that we've mapped uh, through Gaia. Or maybe you want to donate $33 for the distance in light years to a brown dwarf discovered by Jackie in Gaia um, in 2018. Or maybe you have $2 that you would like to donate uh, for the number of Gaia data releases we have had so far. Any amount is welcome and appreciated so much. Seriously, we are always appreciative of all of you. Um, Aaron with an E is going to share that donation link in the chat. Um, so please click on it and check it out. And hopefully we'll see you at Seaball on September 12th. Awesome. Um, Jackie, can you tell us a little bit about how you got your start? Because I believe you started as an intern. Am I correct? Yeah. Uh, after undergrad, I had this uh, desire to be a what I call a normal person rather than the classic academic that just goes straight into like 30 years of school. Mm -hmm. So um, I was working a tech job, but I really missed astronomy. So I did what I think was the right thing, which was I really wanted to be at the Hayden Planetarium because I'm from the New York area. And so I sent, I don't know, somewhere between like 10 and 30 emails to the director of the planetarium, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who was not as famous as he is right now. And um, basically imploring him to employ me for free because the planetarium had just reopened. It was awesome, it was gorgeous. And I thought it would be a fun place. And while Neil at first was not <laughs> the supportive mentor uh, in the idea of bringing me in right away, he did pass me on to Brian Abbott, who was a data visualizer there, who did bring me in. And it's all cleared now. Neil and I are good friends, so, um, and we're colleagues. So he, he, I'll speak for him. He regrets not encouraging me right away to come to the planetarium. But I was an intern and then I wouldn't go away. So they hired me and I worked in the education department for two years. Oh my goodness. See everybody, persistence. Persistence. Just just send those emails, you never know. And actually we have with us today a few teen interns, Adler teen interns. They sent us hundreds of emails uh, before we finally let them in. Just kidding. Um, they are so smart and amazing. Uh, everybody, please welcome our teens, Esma and Kyrie. Um, go ahead and unmute you guys. Hi, hi friends. Welcome. Uh, just to let you all know, the Adler Summer Teen inter Internship Program uh, places current high school students into the professional museum roles. It helps them to work on real science projects and develop professional soft skills and build an awesome network of friends and peers. I highly recommend any kind of teen internship program, but especially the Adlers. Um, so Esma, Kyrie, can you tell us a little bit about yourselves? Introduce yourselves. You're amazing. We want to hear from you. Well, my myself being Kyrie, I will be attending Ball State University with a major in astronomy so that I can become an astrophysicist. I enjoy video game design and looking at the night sky and is included with that. I'm also interested in theater. I've been working for a very long time at my own school, being in three theater classes and even sacrificing my own lunch <laughs> to teach theater one so they can get into it and hopefully continue on the next year. Yes, Kyrie, keep it up. Even when you're 33 years old, spend your nights going and performing theater after working a nine to five, eat your dinner in a green room. I promise never stop doing it coming from me. Sorry for that interjection. <laughs> Esma, introduce yourself. Hi. Um, hello, my name is Esma and like Kyrie, I'm an intern at the Adler. 
I'll be a rising senior at Kenwood High School this year, and I'll be applying to University of Chicago as well this year. And I'm hoping to major in something STEM related. Uh, some of my hobbies are painting, and I recently started making resin jewelry. And I also started an Etsy shop for my art. So <gasps> please share your Etsy shop with everybody. What is it called? It is called Inner Art Expressions. Uh, maybe you could put that in the chat so it's easier. Yes, please, Erin with an E, share it, Inner Art Expressions. Um, everybody check out Esma's Etsy shop. I love Etsy so much. They're doing amazing things right now too. Um, okay, so this is the first year that our summer internship program has been virtual, obviously, circumstances. Um, so what has that been like? How has your summer been? Well, actually, this is my second summer being with the Adley. The first time was Astro Science Workshop, which was really fun. But being my first virtual internship, this was a very different experience for me. Working online has brought so many various complications, but also very fun and interesting moments working with people like you every day. I love this. Esma, how do you feel about this summer? So this is actually my first time in interning at the Adler, but previously before this pandemic, I was attending a virtual school. So working online isn't exactly something that's super new to me but I'm definitely enjoying meeting new people and expanding my knowledge on astronomy. That is so amazing. Um, tell us a little bit about the work you're doing uh, at the SBL with Gaia. So virtual or not, we've done a ton of work with the amazing data set from the Gaia telescope. We've used Gaia data to learn about the stars in our neighborhood and Gaia is really good at getting the distances of stars so that we can figure out where they are on 3D spaces. Amazing. Um, Mark, do we have a data set that we can show? I think we have a, oh, sweet, here it comes. Okay, Kyrie, tell us about what we're seeing. All right, so these stars are within 20 parsecs or approximately 60 light years away from us. And they are our nearest neighbors in the galaxy. We've learned to use this program that you're seeing called GLUE to be able to explore this data from Gaia more thoroughly. <sighs> Blue allows us to select stars in the Gaia data and then show them in open space. For example, we found the nearest sun-like stars in the Gaia data set by using what astronomers call an HR diagram. And to break that down really fast, HR diagrams plot the brightness and colors of stars. Colors can help astronomers measure the temperature of them. Bluer stars are hotter and redder stars are cooler. And they also help figure out the life cycle and evolutions of stars like seeing a photograph of a whole family lets us know how humans grow and age by finding the stars in the diagram that have a similar brightness and color to our sun we were able to find our nearby sun-like stars uh we were both interested in seeing what kind of exoplanets we could find around sun-like stars and exoplanets are basically planets outside of our solar system that orbit other stars we found a few systems that have exoplanets in our sample and we wanted to compare. Like 82, er <laughs> like 82 Eridani, a system with three super Earths. And I learned that even though they're called super Earths, they're not very Earth-like at all. They weigh almost four times as much as the Earth. And these planets that orbit around 82 Eridani have 90 day orbits. And to put that in perspective, in our solar system, their orbits would be inside of Mercury, meaning that one year in these super Earths are closer to a few months on our own. And so in the Virgo constellation, I found 70 Virginis. It hosts one of the first exoplanets to be discovered back in 1996. This exoplanet is about seven times the mass of Jupiter, and it sits between the orbits of Mercury and Venus in our solar system. These types of planets are called hot Jupiters. So I was originally hoping to find a habitable planet in our sample, but I quickly learned that it's actually rare for planets to be in the habitable zone. I learned that for a planet to be in the habitable zone, your planet has to be far enough from the star to not be too hot or too cold so that liquid, liquid water can exist on the surface. And unfortunately, both of the systems that we looked at had planets that were way too hot to have liquid water. So no, no aliens there. Uh, unfortunately, no, but there are definitely other exoplanets that are actually within the habitable zone. So there's still hope that we may meet some new friends. 
Oh my goodness. I'm thinking back to how I spent my summers as a teenager. Um, like just looking out for the next opportunity I'd hang out with friends where could I get a ride to go to the video store to rent a movie um and y'all are looking for exoplanets and uh super earths um in these amazing data sets so just putting it into perspective um that Adler teens are changing the world um awesome thank you so much for sharing this with us Y'all are so smart. Keep it up. Um, oh, we have some, we have a question here. What were the size of the planets you found, Esma? Uh, well, the one exoplanet that I found, it wasn't exact. It was just around seven times the mass of Jupiter. So there wasn't an exact size of the planet, the exoplanet that I found. I can't believe you found an exoplanet. <laughs> um, and then compared to planets in our solar system, I'm assuming that's about size. Uh, how big are some of these exoplanets compared to the ones in our solar system? Well, as I, as I was saying, the the hot Jupiter is uh -huh. seven around seven times the mass of Jupiter. So. Cool, cool. And you All know, right. If you're interested in learning about exoplanets, you can go back to our YouTube channel and watch last uh, the last episode of Adler Astronomy Live, which was on exoplanets. Check that out. Amazing. Yes, please check it out. So much good information there. Um, okay, everybody, we have about eight minutes left of our program. If you have any last minute questions, please start asking them now and Aaron with an E will get them over to us. Um, so think about those now and Aaron with an AA, uh, you have a Zooniverse activity that you'd like to share with everybody, right? Ooh, cool I background. Do. Yeah, you like the background? This is a background for the Zooniverse project Backyard Worlds Planet Nine put together by Becky and the Zooniverse group. Uh, this is a really interesting activity for you, everybody out there to do on Adler's Zooniverse website. Just to say it again, it's called Backyard Worlds Planet Nine. And actually Jackie, who's our guest, is one of the researchers that started this project. So in just a moment, I wanna have Jackie go through how this works, but let me just say that you don't have to be a scientist or really have any special skills. You can get going on this right now, today, af after we're done. Don't go, don't go running away from us now. But we'll show you everything you need to know right here so you can get started. I think Jackie made a good screen grab movie that is going to help illustrate this. So Mark, if you're able to pull that up, and then Jackie, can you explain this to us? Yeah, sure. So Backyard Worlds, colon, Planet Nine um, website here. This is actually, I made this screen grab for you. Uh, this is what the, the website looks like. You go on and you have these images that were taken with a couple of years apart. And we actually subtract them from each other. So this is why you get these dark areas that are kind of black and then the white spots around them. And you look for an object that jumps back and forth. And you can see in this little video showing you how to do it, um, I'm blinking the images. We call them flip books. So we flip over basically five and a half years or so of time. And if a star or brown dwarf, or maybe even planet nine is close by, you can blink and you'll see that object jump around. And in this, I show you, I found one and you can see that green now circled uh, thing jumps from image to image. Um, and that's, it's as easy as that. Just use your eyes. Actually, I always say um, to people, it's it, at the best people at this, the people that are so good at this are really good at pattern recognition, which is a great skill for scientists, one that goes underappreciated. And um, the citizen scientists that are really good at this are like a billion times better at it than I am. So the PhD does not get you this skill. <laughs> this is why we need every person on the planet maybe, or however many are watching on this YouTube, <laughs> to join our project because there is unmapped territory near the sun. And what could you find? Well, you could find another planet in our solar system this way. It's actually how Pluto was found. You could find Nemesis, which we talked about earlier, or you could find a star or a brown dwarf that is closer than the current closest star. We just haven't yes. <laughs> I knew they would make some noise. They're treating where we are like a haunted house. And they would be very good at pattern recognition right now. 
So that's the callback to this particular um, project on Zooniverse that I, I, we have had such luck with the, with people that have worked with us on this. And, um, and I would love to have more people working with us on it. And Jackie, there's a really exciting recent discovery that came out of your project. We probably don't have time to describe it in detail, but do you want to just share a little brief bit about it? Yeah, so some of the most exciting things that people have found are they're close by, brown close by objects, and um, it sounds like elephants, and <laughs> uh, as well as, um, it's a shame you can't see them, um, as well as really weird objects. And so what the citizens found, what a couple, it's like 10 uh, volunteers, citizen scientists, people powered people in our project that just discovered these like totally weird, very old, very bizarre looking cold brown dwarfs. They're some of the coldest, oldest objects ever discovered. So cool. Erin is gonna uh, share the link for Zooniverse and how you can get involved in the chats, please please join and help make some discoveries. Um, amazing. So we have a few last minute questions um, from John Larson. We are in the near North suburbs. How can we best view the night sky? You know, I could handle this one. I'm, yeah. I'm guessing you're talking about near North suburbs of Chicago. That's actually kind of where I live too. Um, so there's a few things you can do. It depends what you want. You can actually watch the moon phases. And so if you go out at a time of night when the moon is not up, or when it's a new moon, you will see more stars because the sky will not be as bright. But one thing you really have to do, if you're going outside and you wanna look at the sky, you need to give yourself like 10 minutes or more to let your eyes adjust. You can't just go from a bright house outside and expect to see a bunch of stars. But if you go out there and let your eyes adjust, you'll be able to see some stars. Um, but really, if you wanna see like the Milky Way, like we were talking about, you need to go someplace that's a real dark sky. Um, and you know, for us, actually, some of the closest parks could be in Wisconsin. I'm not advocating for travel in this uh, situation that we're in right now, but think, you know, use your best judgment. Think about in the future, if you like, that uh, state parks in Wisconsin are really great. There's some state parks in Illinois also. Basically, you want to get away from the city lights. Awesome. Um, okay, and last question we have from Amani Price. What is a super earth? I know we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, but. I can well, handle this one too, actually. Or, or Kai Reed, you want to handle it? I'll cover it since I brought it up. So yeah. essentially a super earth is just a planet that is a few times more than the mass of the earth, given the name super, is really not about the characteristics, but more of the mass itself. And that's why I was given the name. Amazing. Um, well, everybody, we have run out of time. If we did not get to answer your question, please shoot us an email at askadler at adlerplanetarium.org. And one of our experts will get back to you as soon as they can um, with an answer. So please shoot those over to us. Uh, we, we wish we had more time. Um, just to recap everything we talked about today, we got to hear about how we were able to map over a billion stars with our expert Jackie um, and how stars are moving and changing. And we also learned about how Adler teens are doing incredible things, will probably be leaders in their field. They're going to change the world one day, and they are the hope and the light for our future. Uh, <laughs> that's at least what I got out of this. Um, so also, Erin uh, with an E is going to be sharing the link to donate to Seaball again. Once again, that's September 12th. We hope that you are able to attend, and any amount is welcome. Thank you so much to anyone who has contributed so far. And also, Erin will be sharing a link to a survey. Please let us know what you think of our program and what you would like to see more of in the future. Um, or actually, I think that that link will be in the show notes uh, on the YouTube video. So check that out. Okay, thank you everybody so much. Jackie, thank you so much for joining us from New Jersey. Aaron from Chicago. Esma and Kyrie, I believe are in Chicago. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. I hope that y'all have a wonderful afternoon and we'll see you in two weeks. Bye. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye, everybody.